Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, we will continue with our uh, lecture series on this optimal control guidance and estimation course. And so far we have seen uh, calculus of variations approach uh, which leads to this two point boundary value problem followed by this uh, LQR which is a subset of that and then the little bit extension of that in the in the framework of SDRE and theta D. Okay. And then uh, last couple of lectures we have also seen what is that uh, this uh, dynamic programming approach. Uh, where it leads to this HJB so equations. However, the HJB equation is uh, nonlinear partial differential equation and all that. So, that lands, lands up with uh, uh, this uh, curse of uh, dimensionality. The first approach leads to curse of complexity, the second approach leads to curse of dimensionality really. But anyway, so there are uh, there are techniques uh, evolving techniques and all that uh, which tries to avoid those problems in a limited sense at least. And one of that happens to be approximate dynamic programming, which I have already seen there. Okay. And similarly, we will, uh, I mean, slowly what you are, what I am telling is uh, we are going towards the so called uh, real time optimal control. That means the, the solution techniques are so powerful that the solution is available very quickly, actually. So, that means you can think of using these algorithms uh, really online. So, this one of these uh, techniques happens to be this uh, model predictive static programming which I am going to talk in this lecture as well as next lecture. And we will see uh, some application of uh, this particular uh, technique in the framework of uh, optimal guidance of aerospace vehicles. Okay. So, essentially if you know the any guidance problem is a, is a trajectory optimization problem that means uh, it can be I mean ideally it should be formulated as a as an optimal control problem. But because of this uh, curse of dimensionality or curse of complexity and these are these are typically never used uh, online. However, as I told there are uh, several methods evolving uh, which tries to kind of overcome that and one of that happens to be this uh, model predictive static programming. So, let us uh, let us see what it is. So, outline of this lecture will be something like this uh, uh, first is motivation why we do that and uh, then some mathematical details of this uh, this particular design and then I will take you through a little bit uh, intensive way this uh, re-entry guidance of a reusable launch vehicle using this MPSP technique and ultimately I will give you some references to follow it up as well. Alright, so let us get going the first is motivation and let us see what motivations are there for this particular technique. The very first thing that comes to mind is high computational efficiency that means what you are looking for is some sort of real time online solution. The second thing uh, what you are looking here is uh, terminal conditions uh, should be met as hard constraints and especially in missile guidance problems this essentially leads to high terminal accuracy. That means, uh, if you are uh, if you are working on a missile guidance problem the very first thing that you want is to go towards the target as close as possible and uh, in that sense uh, hard constraints are typically much better actually. I will take you through some examples in, uh, in next class and on that actually. All right, so that is the next thing, okay. and especially it is not necessarily only missile guidance. I mean, in any aerospace guidance or ground vehicle guidance, underwater guidance, anything that you think about, the ultimate aim is when T goes to TF or final time goes to current time goes to final time. You want certain objectives to be met actually. In other words, your position vector should be very close to the target position vector, and your velocity angles especially should be in for some particular desirable values and all that actually those things can also be met actually that way. So, it can be essentially used for any aerospace vehicle and especially very particular it can be for missile guidance as well. So, the next one that you are looking for is uh, no approximation of system dynamics that means uh, as we saw that in the adaptive critic techniques and all we do not want to kind of linearize the system dynamics or quasi linearize and things like that and then talk about lot of analysis which, which essentially leads to some sort of a close form or semi close form solution. However, the very very fact is we have actually started with linearizing the system dynamics which you do not want to do. Okay. The next one is uh, on the way minimum control usage is also our 
our objective of course that should not be compromising the output accuracy at the at the final time okay so without compromising on the output accuracy at the final time what you really want is a is a path from a given initial condition which will take actually minimum control and lead to extremely high accuracy and we really want a very highly computational efficient method which will essentially lead to real time online solution actually so that's the type of motivation that you are looking for here all right so this uh, this model predictive static programming obviously you can see that uh, partly the very name suggests model predictive it the philosophy is partly borrowed from model predictive control okay so this model predictive control uh, is something like output dynamics replaces the state dynamics in a in a 2.1 rivoli problem and that is what the features uh, some of the features of this mpsp technique is actually relies on that part what about the other side of the story it is also inspired from the philosophy of approximate dynamic programming and uh, both of the techniques you have seen so far so i hope you are able to connect uh, uh, what i am talking here actually so essentially what it uh, what's the approximate dynamic programming is essentially a discrete formulation that avoids the hjv equation in a way so here we also talk about a discrete time framework in this in this particular design where the the particular steps and numbers and things like that are are inspired from our iterative control side actually and those of you who want to refer uh, i mean uh, the uh, details part of it and all you can actually see this reference uh, this is the first publication that we published in about uh, i mean 2009 in a journal actually okay, so you can see that and i i'll also list out a few more uh, journal papers and conference papers things like that the end of this lecture as well as next lecture actually all right so let's get on with the mathematical details part of it now uh, the we'll slowly go through the steps and try to understand what is what's really happening here actually okay the very first thing is uh, you, as i told it is also inspired from discrete system dynamics and all that so oh, for the first thing to do here is we have a system dynamics in this form remember this is a complete nonlinear form and then there is a output which is also a nonlinear function of x actually sorry okay okay so this is uh, this is actually a nonlinear system dynamics and also can you pay no linear output and also remember that this uh, this output that i'm talking here is actually the desirable output it's an, it's not really the sensor output actually okay so both the things are uh, discretized okay you typically it is done through this uh, the system dynamics discretization is typically done through this uh, this euler integration actually okay so what's the objective objective is uh, as we go along that means uh, k varies from actually this uh, if you interpret that in the form of time domain this is uh, one k, k varies from 1 2 3 4 like that and ultimately you have this uh, this n and just before that is n minus 1 and remember control typically acts up to n minus 1 where state evolves up to time step n actually so what you are looking here is uh, at time step uh, n okay we have this uh, i mean the subjective to be met is uh, this yn which is nothing but h of xn okay so it go towards a particular desirable value yn star okay and of course as i, as I mentioned before with additional some optimal objectives and all we less him on the way actually okay so this is the particular problem when you uh, i mean when the star state starts evolving at the final point n okay ye ve xn okay okay oh, oh. all right at the final point n we have this xn and this xn if you evaluate uh, h of xn then you will get yn and this yn should actually go to certain yn star actually okay that's the that's our objective basically okay all right so what's the philosophy here uh, obviously we st uh, we start with uh, some sort of a guess history i mean that's typically with respect to uh, i mean this is a typically way a typical way of solving optimal control problems we say we start with a control guess history and we have initial condition so we start propagating the system dynamics and ultimately when we reach there we we arrive at some sort of yn value 
but obviously that is uh, not close to yn star because uh, because the um, control that you have applied is actually a, a guess history control okay so there is an error there and so the the objective here is how do we adjust this guess value values guess value of the control history so that after the update the trajectory will actually lead to that particular xn which we if, uh, using which if you evaluate yn it will be closer to yn star actually okay so that's the objective here so so mathematically speaking we can define some sort of a error okay delta yn Okay, this this delta y n is is nothing but y n minus y n star, and that should go to zero. Okay, remember y n should go to y n star. So obviously the difference should go to zero. Okay, so what's the philosophy? First we have to guess the control history, and then uh, simulate the system dynamics from the initial condition that we are interested in. Okay, then we have to compute the error in the output. Okay, at the final time, and you have to utilize this error information to update the control history optimally okay then obviously we have to repeat this iteration until convergence okay and uh, it actually it, uh, it somebody can see that there is the steps if you see it little carefully this is very close to what we have seen in shooting method actually in a way okay then obviously uh, somebody can ask what's the beauty here the whole beauty here is uh, the update happens iterate the control history until convergence what you what you see in the last step this iteration happens very very fast actually okay so why it happens and all that i will i will tell you as we go along actually all right so let us start analyzing this is, see as i told we we started with a with a guess history of the control but uh, that leads to this uh, this error in uh, error in uh, output okay object, i mean the output at final time so now we want to analyze this error okay, and tell how much the error we have done in in the control everywhere actually remember we have a we have a control here in this uh, time history if you go back we have a control u1 here you have u2 here you have u3 here and and things like that actually okay all the way up to un minus 1 the thing is these these values are erroneous so we want to update it so obviously we want to update u1 u2 everything okay so that uh, the the updated control history will take us to the desirable value okay all right so we want to analyze first okay how much error we made and what is the effect of that error in this delta yn actually okay how much error we made in the control everywhere all the time steps and how much effect it had in this particular delta y n actually okay so here we introduce uh, this small error approximation i mean obviously the demand that you start with a reasonably good guess basically it did not be very good but ultimately it turns out that it's not that sensitive actually you can start with a large error as well but theoretically speaking it uh, it demands that okay this delta y n is approximated like a dy n actually so that's a small by small error approximation and using this smaller approximation okay what you do here is the delta y n by dx delta x n into dx n actually okay that means uh, this dy n what you see uh, we analyze that where does it come from actually because ultimately remember y is a function of x okay so if there is an error in y it has to come through the error in x it cannot escape from that actually okay so we assume that that is what it is okay and also assume that we are not starting from really i mean this uh, this is actually it can be applied uh, from any time so what you are telling here is uh, our uh, okay let me uh, okay. okay we start with uh, not really one every time suppose we are uh, we are operating at time point uh, i mean time step 3 then that becomes our initial time that means uh, we start operating from any any k actually really okay so that's what we are doing here so we want to analyze backwards up to time step k basically but anyway so coming back uh, this this was an error delta y n okay so this is this uh, smaller approximation dy n and this calculus simply tells us that this dy n has to happen because of dx n and this is the relationship actually okay now the question here is uh, what is this dx n okay you have this uh, this time step uh, n and then there is n minus 1 actually okay there was a problem in xn okay however this xn if you if you see the system uh, dynamics uh, system dynamics tells us that xk plus 1 is a function of fk xk uk basically okay 
So, obviously, the if there is a there is an error in x n, then the, there is some error in x n minus 1 and u n minus 1 actually. So, that means, x n minus 1 and n minus 1 ok. Well, x n minus 1 and u n minus 1 both have an effect towards x n actually. Okay. So, that is why any amount of error that I make in uh, x n, okay, there is certainly some error in, in x n minus 1 and u n minus 1 both actually. Okay. So, that is why I want to uh, expand this d x n okay, in the in the x I mean in the variables uh, d x n minus 1 and d u n minus 1 actually. Okay, and remember this is the well uh, the uh, instead of going back again, what we have here is x k k plus one is actually f of x k u k. Okay, so obviously x n okay x n happens to be a function of x n minus one and u n minus one actually. Okay, so if you see this, then obviously d x n if you if you see that from this expression you can you can relate to this this d x n. Okay, this particular thing you can find out, and then you can tell. Okay, this this should be related to something like d x n, and then there is something like d u n actually. Okay. So this is what uh, what we want to do. Okay. So uh, we don't want to touch that. That we keep it as it is. But uh, d x n, I want to expand it backwards. Okay, and then I write want to write it as something like this. Okay, d f n minus one by d sorry del f n minus 1 by del x n minus 1 into d x n minus 1 plus del f n minus 1 by del u n minus 1 into d u n minus 1. Okay. Now, here what you see here is this control uh, variables are all decision variables. That means, if you have made some error there, then we, there is a direct chance of correcting that actually. Okay. So, it does not come from anywhere because we, because we took a wrong decision that is why this d u n minus 1 is coming actually. However, what about d x n minus 1? Again going back to that, uh, any time the state evolves because of the previous state and the previous control actually. Okay. So, again you see that okay, d x n minus 1, I can expand it in the form of d x n minus 2 and d u n minus 2 actually. Okay. This particular thing, what you see d x minus 1 is expanded in the form of d x n minus 2 and d u n minus 2 actually. So, d d u n minus 1 we keep as it is that we do not want to change actually. Okay. This this one is kept as it is actually. Now, what happens is uh, you continue this exercise uh, okay, until the uh, until the final I mean until the initial time and as I told here in this problem okay, we, we interrupt it uh, the initial time is up to k actually. So, I start with n then n minus 1 then n minus 2 and I keep on continuing this way okay. and uh, here I will end up with this time step t k okay. this represents t k that is where my problem starts actually. Okay. So, I will continue up to um, this time step uh, k basically. Okay. So, I will do that and then I, I can see that that uh, this the entire expression will lead to something like this actually. Okay. There is uh, first there will be some sort of error in the initial condition okay, d x k that is my current time condition of the state. So, that is my error in the initial condition and then there is a bunch of expressions which will tell us that okay, there is an error in d u k, the next term will tell us there is an error in d u k plus 1 and things like that actually. This will continue up to this uh, d u n minus 1 actually okay. and some of you can uh, can now see that there is some degree of uh, kind of inspiration from approximate dynamic programming. That is what uh, I mean this sensitivity analysis part what you are talking here is just kind of borrowed from that side actually. Alright, what next actually? We have done that, but here we observe that there, there cannot be any initial condition error because we, we assume that the initial condition is known to us actually. That is from that is where we want the solution anyway. So, this goes to 0. Okay. So, ultimately what it leads to is something like this actually. So, this d y n what is, what is evaluated as delta y n is can be, can be I mean can be expressed as b k times d u k plus b k plus 1 times d u k plus 1 all the way up to b n minus 1 times d u n minus 1. 
Now, these matrices what you see here, I am I redefined as BK, BK plus 1 and all that here. The okay, Somebody can argue that okay, uh, what is happening here? It is actually, if you see the first thing, then it is actually multiplication of 2 matrices. The very previous one will be a multiplication of 3 matrices and it keeps on piling on actually. Okay, that means, your uh, number of matrices computation of the, for computing the sensitivity matrices is essentially large actually in a way. So, how, how can that uh, computational efficiency be retained? Now, if, if you look at it slightly closely, it, uh, it turns out that these matrices actually can be computed recursively. Okay, so, this recursive computation actually is one of the key features why it is computational efficient actually. I will tell you there are other reasons as well actually. And also notice that the, the dimension of this equation here, okay, what you see here is dimension of y n, it has, it has nothing to do with uh, dimension of state actually really. Okay. And typically this dimension of y happens to be much lesser than the dimension of the state. That means, the ultimately the, the number of equations that you are talking here is dictated by how many outputs you want to control at the final time really. Okay. So, that actually helps uh, and that gives us another reason why it is computationally efficient actually. Okay. Now, also, also notice a big thing here okay, that this particular relationship what you are getting here is actually an algebraic constraint. Okay. There is no differential equation involved in all that here. That is probably the biggest reason why this is computationally more efficient actually. That means, somehow we can, there is a hope that we can actually formulate a static optimization problem actually. That is why this name model predictive static programming is given. By the way, if, uh, as I have told before, programming stands for optimization actually. So, model predictive static optimization you can think about that. Okay. Anyway, coming back, this is the constraint equation that we got. What it tells is, okay, we made these much errors, okay, this d u k, d u k plus 1 and all that. So, this much errors are we made and hence we landed up with this d y n because these are the sensitivity matrices associated with them. B k is a sensitivity of uh, d u k okay, with respect to d y n like that actually. Okay. All right, so, this is what it is and we will see how these matrices can be computed recursively. Uh, this is the relationship uh, that you can see about. If you talk about any B k tilde, okay, this uh, k tilde is actually a dynamic variable like this, then any B k tilde you can be expressed like this. Okay. So, if you observe little closely, first uh, first we can probably define this B n minus 1 0 as something like the coefficient that multiplies everywhere. Okay. And then we we operate on this this kind of iteration actually. B k 0 is B k minus, I mean B k tilde is B k tilde plus 1. That is essentially it is a backward recursion actually. So, this one uh, multiply by that actually. Okay. Whatever additional term you are getting here will multiply by that actually. Okay. Okay. Ultimately, after computing all these BK zeros, all that we do is we multiply all this uh, BK tilde by BK tilde 0 into del FK by del UK. That means, what you see del FK by del UK, we take it out, separate it out. And the in between terms that remains, we just uh, start uh, kind of re getting recursively. Ultimately, we just multiply one sort actually. Okay, so, that is the way of uh, recursive computation of the sensitivity matrices actually. Okay. Now, what about this? Now, what you, what you see here, this constraint equation is a small dimensional algebraic constraint equation that is clear here. But also remember how many free variables we have. This number of free variables depends on the dimension of the control variable multiplied by the number of time steps available. Okay. So, that means, there are uh, so many freedoms out here, okay, unless you assume that you are at the very final time and things like that, forget that. You can assume that there are enough time steps uh, here available. So, that means, uh, we have lot of freedom and uh, we what we want is actually a less number of constraints. That means, it is severely under constraint equation actually. So, when you have something like an under constraint equation, there is a scope of optimizing actually. So, that optimize uh, that essentially lead us to this, uh, this static optimization ideas actually. So, what you do here is not only you want to satisfy this constraint, but you also want to uh, I mean think about minimizing the control history this way. So, why this uh, this term here? This is actually the, the updated control. Okay. So, the control history will be updated that way. You have the, this previous value. Uh, Okay, or the guess value of the control to begin with or the previous value and this is what the correction you want. So, this is uh, what the updated control value will be 
and this one uh, transpose times r into d u k and uh, r into u the essentially what you are telling is u transpose r u sort of thing okay. so essentially you are telling that okay i i want to have some sort of a control minimizing solution actually and also remember there are enough uh, freedoms out here i mean a little bit more freedom out here but in some particular some particular problems it may so happen that you will want a solution which will actually minimize d u k s not u k not u k in general actually okay why because if you really i'll see that next example and all if you if your control history that you want has to be bounded between some maximum minimum value you will typically like to operate in the middle segment actually uh, that is trivially non I mean, typically non zero basically okay so in that those situations you'd like to have the, this duk transpose r duk instead of U, uk transpose uh, r uk sort of thing but anyway just to maintain generality we'll assume that it is a, is a control minimizing solution so we'll take uh, this cost function subject to this constraint okay whatever constraint you have taken i have derived already basically now you can clearly see that it's actually nothing but a static optimization problem actually okay so we can follow the very standard formulas uh, standard uh, rules uh, logics whatever you have studied before for static optimization and then the procedure tells that we have to uh, we have to first construct some sort of a augmented cost function okay and this augmented cost cost function is something like this we have the original cost function plus lambda transpose uh, this uh, this entire equation okay minus dy and sort of thing okay once you have that this is actually a, a problem Uh, for uh, I mean J K bar, uh, the free variables here is D U D U S and lambda S as well actually. So we have to take derivatives of uh, with respect to both actually. So we take uh, derivative with respect to D U K tilde first. Okay, so that essentially leads to something like this, and then we have this second equation del J K bar by del lambda equal zero, which talks about something like this. Okay. now these two equations needs to be solved together to get your control history get our control history update actually okay now what you observe here again this because this is a static equation that we we started with okay the constant variable that you require here is also static okay that means just a constant vector that we need actually and that is probably the biggest reason why it is computationally efficient in other words uh, utilizing a single lambda single lambda single vector lambda will be able to update the entire control history okay which is a major departure from this two point boundary value problem solution so it is actually anyway coming back these are the two equations that we want to solve and essentially eliminate lambda so how do you do that first you solve this in terms of lambda then substitute here solve for lambda and go back actually that's what it is done here you first you solve these values in terms of lambda then you go back to the constant equation put the value expressions there and solve for lambda once you solve for lambda you can again go back and put the lambda values here and get to get the solution that you require actually so essentially it will tell us that lambda can be solved something like this where a lambda okay is defined like this and b lambda defined like that once lambda is known our du k histories are all known actually okay again i emphasize or i repeat that with uh, with a single coasted variable okay you will be able to compute all the necessary corrections for for control variables at, at all the grid points actually Okay. All right. So this is how it is. Also closely, you can if you notice this, uh, if you see, if you see this, this a lambda and b lambda are typically functions of only this. Uh, I mean, the sensitivity matrices largely. Okay. And R K inverse and all the R K are typically selected as part of the cost function. And this U K zero is is your previous uh, solution. That means previous uh, either guess history or or the previous iteration value actually. so knowing the previous values okay and knowing the sensitivity matrices we can very quickly compute the lambda okay remember sensitivity matrices can be computed recursively so using that you can compute lambda and once you compute lambda your control history updates are all known actually okay so this is why it is uh, why is computational efficient actually so finally the control update can be written something like this okay and uh, i mean Your lambda is given like that actually. Also, so at this point of time, somebody can argue that okay, I mean, in, in our own observ observation, uh, most of the time this uh, this entire method converges very rapidly. Also, okay, we just need about uh, three, I mean, about four five iterations at the maximum for getting some good solutions actually. Okay. However, uh, you can uh, also think that okay, uh, 
even if that is not allowable, I mean, suppose my time sequence is very large and then even one iteration takes long time and things like I am not sure how long, how many iterations it will take and things like that. Then it will, uh, I mean, you can think about doing, I mean, incorporating this, uh, this idea of iteration unfolding. That means, uh, it is very simple. It is all that it talks is, it tells is, okay, I start with k, I have k plus 1 and I will, I have to go all the way up to n minus 1 anyway, okay. So, what I will do is, I will operate uh, based on a fixed number of iterations, okay. So, I suppose I operate based on something like, I will not wait until it converts, but I will operate uh, based on, let us say, 5 iterations only. And, and my computation will show that I can actually do the 5 iterations in the available time window actually. So, every time I will, I will either operate on the fixed uh, number of iterations or I can change that as well, okay. I can operate 5 iterations here, 5 iterations there and things like that. Or, as you remember, as you note that you, when you go closer and closer, Okay, your time time available becomes shorter and shorter. That means number of time time grids actually. Okay, so number of uh, time grids becomes smaller and smaller here. Okay, so then you can think of okay, wait, I can actually do more number of iteration necessary. I can probably do eight iteration there actually. But these number five, eight, and all that will be pre priori fixed depending on your problem actually, and depending on the computational power and and real time algorithm that you use and things like that, that way actually. So, nobody forbids from doing that, but however, my observation, my comment here is um, in, in many of the problems that we have solved, it actually takes about 4 5 iterations only to converge anyway. So, the entire algorithm can be re can be represented like this, uh, it is very close to a so kind of sorting method if you think about. Uh, you start with some sort of a guess control history, propagate the system dynamics, compute the output, check for convergence. And largely, when I talk about convergence, I talk about output convergence, whether y n has gone to y n star actually. And also remember, when y n goes to y n star, or at the same time, it turns out that uh, j also goes to some sort of j also, I mean, the cost function also try to, you know, kind of goes towards convergence actually, okay. Anyway, so this uh, check for convergence, if it is, it is converse, uh, they take the converse solution and stop actually. And if it does not, then uh, you just go there and then, and then update the compute the sensitivity matrices recursively and then update the control history and go. Now, also remember a small comment out here that is for uh, control to adjust, it all depends on this d y n actually, okay. Because this algorithm if you see the convergence check that you are doing here is d y n whether it has gone, gone to 0 or not. Now, uh, now remember these are nonlinear problems that you may have multiple solutions and things like that. That means, uh, if your guess happens to be good, okay. Even though the trajectory need not be optimal from cost function point of view, you may actually get eluded that uh, y n has gone to y n star and hence my solution is optimal actually. So, my suggestion for that is uh, do not get eluded that way, at you, at you allow for at least one iteration you know, forcefully. That means, do not bother about uh, ch checking convergence from the very beginning, just allow one iteration from the second iteration onwards you can probably check actually. Okay, so that is uh, what it is actually. All right. So, I have all told uh, everything on the way, but let me summarize uh, the reasons for uh, computational efficiency, why it is computational efficient. The very first thing as I told, uh, the costed variable becomes static, that means uh, only one time independent, that means constant costed vector is needed for the entire control history update basically. That is the primary, the, the major reason why it is computationally quite efficient. And then dimension of the coastal vector is same as the dimension of the output vector, okay, which is typically much lesser than the number of states actually. Okay. Essentially, if this is lesser, then the dimension of the, the lambda also becomes lesser actually. It is directly, I mean, it is same as the output vector dimension actually. And the coastal vector is, is computed uh, symbolically, okay. coastal vector, uh, well, it is theoretically speaking, it is coastal, uh, okay. coastal vector at every iteration is computed symbolically. And then it leads to some sort of a closed form control history update actually, okay. This, it does not lead to closed form control per se, closed form control history, but it leads to this closed form control history update, okay. DUs you are able to kind of compute very fast actually, okay. All right, the computation, uh, okay involves largely the sensitivity matrices which are also computed recursively. That is another reason why it is computationally efficient. And if necessary, as I told, concepts like iteration unfolding can, can be incorporated to save computational time even further actually. Okay. So, these are the, I mean, last issue is, uh, is primarily a mechanization issue, 
but all other things the first uh, five issues uh, five points are actually the algorithm eccentric actually this happens because of the algorithm really okay. and there are important extensions also we have proposed and i will uh, probably take you through some of this uh, and then extensions is uh, first thing is there is a variation of this which talks about uh, something called model predictive spread control okay this is a kind of a version with control parameterization that means uh, you you parameterize the control variable okay let me talk about that uh, a little bit philosophically suppose uh, u contains something like u1 and u2 so what you do is uh, ui you let's say you parameterize like a constant vector or something like a ai ti or t go sort of thing in visual guidance we will do that so ai t plus something like bi so that means with respect to time what i am looking for is something like a stray okay sorry for that what what i am looking for is with respect to time i am looking for something like a straight line equation actually or you can think of bi0 then uh, this uh, this straight line passes through the origin or probably you can think of uh, ai0 then it's just a constant thing and all that okay so but the constant itself is updated in a, in a systematic manner using this philosophy and all that actually. so that is uh, model predictive spread control so what it does it further improves the computational time because the inter, instead of entire control history grid point by grid point what you are doing here is updating the coefficients only okay grid points are automatically taken care because of the polynomial fitting that we already have so essentially it further improves the computational time and also it smooths the control history by enforcement so remember the other one may or may not happen because every grid point it is treated as some sort of independent uh, control value basically so smoothness may happen and this does happen in most of the cases but theoretical guarantee comes uh, when you have something like a polynomial fitting so no matter whatever ai and vi you take this is essentially some sort of a okay 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 the what you what you see here is this is ui okay and this is t okay so this is guaranteed to be smooth actually okay so that is uh, this part of it uh, we will we will see that uh, i mean probably one or two classes down the line actually okay. and then there is another extension which is called generalized mpsp very recent development uh, uh, around 2011 12 like that so what happens here is uh, we started with something like a discrete time frame framework and so essentially we have revisited the entire problem formulation and we have proposed some sort of a equivalent development in continuous time framework also that means uh, somebody i mean it's not necessarily that you have to start with discretization of the formulation and all that actually you can carry on with the continuous time uh, framework uh, from beginning to end but of course for implementation sense you have to always do some discretization at the end actually i'll i'll talk about these two methods uh, in after one more class probably okay we'll see some of this uh, generalization and things like that all right so these are these are extension part of it now going back to some some example problems and all so i thought here i thought instead of going through this typical textbook sort of small small examples we will rather go to a very practical example and see what's the implications there actually okay so this essentially talks about uh, reentry guidance of a reusable launch vehicle okay. and uh, as you know this reusable launch vehicle is also a, a kind of uh, draws lot of attention world over because essentially by repeated launch of the vehicle okay you can you are essentially aiming to bring down the cost of the launch of the satellite actually okay so that's what uh, it happens but uh, it, it throws its own challenge and all that so how do you overcome that and all we'll see actually okay so this is a typical uh, kind of trajectory and all that uh, from beginning to end the launch vehicle takes some sort of a, a vehicle at its stop uh, okay on the way the launch vehicle itself drops out and after that this vehicle okay has to be recovered and it has to essentially go to a runway but also you can think about something like a splash down in sea and nothing like that but you can essentially run to some sort of a runway actually okay so this is the reentry segment that you are interested in and then uh, we are talking about uh, these numbers and all you can forget these are uh, i mean typical values and all but it doesn't matter it depends from vehicle to vehicle varies from vehicle to vehicle like that actually okay. but essentially the the approach is somewhat similar it it goes to somewhere and then after some time or it actually launches a satellite there and then after launching the satellite it has to come down and uh, and recover itself so what you are interested in here in this particular problem is the reentry segment okay this uh, this reentry segment 
is a very critical segment because it several constraints acts on the vehicle actually. So, how do you do that? Okay. And remember this this MPSP technique that we are talking here, uh, there are certain uh, kind of limitations as well which we did not talk probably. The very first limitation is uh, okay, well, let me kind of go back to that and probably show some of that basically. Okay, so, the cost function that we have assumed okay, conveniently rather uh, happens to be a function of control variable only. Okay. So, the boundary conditions are there uh, that means, at t equal to t f there are certain objectives for the output and all that is uh, that is there, but on the uh, on the path actually where the cost function is not a function of the state, it, it is st still a function of uh, control only basically. The second thing is uh, I mean uh, uh, the essentially what you are talking here is uh, well the constraint, control constraints and all that. So, those things are still not accounted for actually. Okay. So, essentially by, by using this, uh, this necessary conditions uh, here, what you are assuming is uh, the control is actually unconstrained. Okay. Okay. So, these are the primarily two kind of limitations that acts on this algorithm okay. as of now of course, I mean you can think of doing further research to kind of relax some of these conditions actually. Anyway, so this is what it is and this is a re-entry segment and we are interested in something like a, the idea here is to de develop advanced non-linear optimal, uh, non-linear and optimal guidance for an RLV okay, in the descent phase with special emphasis on critical re-entry segment actually. So, what are the challenges here? Okay, well the first challenge is uh, path constraint and path constraints there are several constraints the structural load, thermal load, angle of attack boundary the primarily three things together. And then there is this uh, and remember this angle of attack plays a very critical role because it essentially gives two things one is controllability of the vehicle and it is also very strongly coupled to the structural load actually. Structural load is a direct function of angle of attack really actually. Okay. So, this has to be kind of uh, handled very carefully actually. Okay. So, there is a path constraint which essentially talks about structural load, thermal load, angle of attack boundary like that and there is also a terminal constraint that ultimately uh, at the end of the re-entry we want to go to some position and then in specific velocity vector sense also basically. Okay. So, that means the velocity magnitude as well as its direction needs to be in specific direction so that uh, ultimately we can recover the vehicle and land the vehicle actually. Okay. Remember uh, this RLV does not have any thrust that means you get only one chance to land actually. Okay. Uh, you cannot keep on moving uh, around an airport and try to find out and things like that. It, it just gets one chance and then with that one chance we have to get it back actually. Okay. And then we also aim to the op generate some sort of optimal trajectory and then obviously it has to have robustness with respect to uncertainty parameters. Uh, what we mean in parameters essentially inertia and aerodynamic parameters and typically they are not very accurate, they will have some some 20 30 percent inaccuracy in aerodynamic parameter and some about 5 10 percent inaccuracy in, in inertia parameters like moment of inertia mass and all that actually. So, the, the algorithm has to be robust to that actually. Okay. Then there is this real time computability issue and obviously, there is another issue of smoothness in the guidance command generation also. Why do you need smoothness? Because ultimately what you generate, what you interpret as control variable in guidance loop happens to be nothing but the output uh, I mean reference command input to the inner loop okay, where it needs to be tracked perfectly actually and uh, track uh, as close as possible. So, that is where having a smoothness smooth history in the guidance command actually helps there basically. So, these are the things that we are looking for here. Okay, now, when you go back uh, to this the dynamics right uh, I have taken this dynamics from this reference uh, essentially I think this, is this uh, book is available probably free to free download or something these days. I have seen uh, soft copies actually, but anyway. So, uh, otherwise you can think of uh, locating in some library and all that actually. Okay. So, anyway, so the this is obvious these three equations are essentially the radius from center of earth and then there is this uh, I mean this uh, um, latitude and longitude actually. Okay. So, essentially it talks about uh, spherical earth and rotating earth as well actually, it talks about everything spherical rotating earth if you assume that you talk about spherical trigonometry and all that that way. And the coordinates uh, position coordinate that is defined is in terms of uh, r pi and theta okay, uh, altitude essentially and this uh, l l I mean this uh, latitude and longitude actually. But this is kinematic component, what about dynamic component? 
then equations will contain v gamma and psi which v is the velocity vector velocity magnitude and gamma and psi are essentially the flight path angle and heading angle actually so these are, if you see that this equation has already become quite kind of a mess actually okay so first uh, first thing what it is is uh, formulated only with pitch plane maneuvers that means we thought okay bank angle can be suppressed in other words bank angle all that it assures is just uh, moving the vehicle in the one single direction without changing the direction of the velocity vector sideways actually okay it just goes up and down vertical sort of thing and also we neglected this earth rotation part of it actually okay so okay it's a short duration mission if it happens the earth rotation doesn't matter that much so what happens there actually okay so okay with that results uh, these are these are the something some reentry conditions that you constraints that you think about there are some of the values that we we apply to the kind of problem and then we thought okay uh, what about getting the solution out of it actually okay so then uh, i told this uh, okay this is a formulation in terms of uh, really what is called as uh, specific energy and specific energy is nothing but this kinetic en e is something like uh, kinetic energy mgh plus uh, half mv square divided by mg okay per unit weight actually so essentially it h plus v square by 2g sort of thing actually okay so this is uh, if you if you know e and then uh, if you know v the h is given actually that way so this uh, these three are linear dependent now basically so we talk about v and gamma essentially and then control vector is alpha and the output vector happens to be z sort of thing actually whatever is uh, there anyway so this is the formulation that we do that we followed and also remember this is angle of attack is bounded between these two so we wanted a middle value as close to that as possible so with the cost function assumed was something like deviation minimization actually so part of that this this part does deviation minimization this part kind of assures the normal load factor should be minimum okay and this essentially kind of guarantees smoothness actually in a way okay so what you did here is if you see this result uh, this is uh, some sort of a, another method solution actually what you what you have in blue line here take that as initial guess actually okay and then run it through this algorithm and then uh, found out that okay this uh, this problem can equivalently be solved using this trajectory rather what you see here in, in this color for red line sort of thing okay. what is beauty here this this uh, this line compared to the blue one this one is not only smoother okay which is much more smoother actually and it also happens to be lying somewhere in the middle part okay whereas this blue line is actually touching to the upper side right here which is not allowable actually okay anyway so coming to the uh, the perturbation study and things like that we have done some uh, okay some some sort of perturbation study is using this uh, randomly varying coefficients and all that and essentially we done some 480 simulations and all that and uh, some different different middle points initial points and things like that essentially you can see that the the normal load since it is slightly getting violated here its value is 3g but is getting around 3.2g sort of thing but the number of cases that got violated is also small actually okay so if you, in other words if the structural limit becomes 3.2g instead of 3 3g then it is within that but even otherwise the, the number of failures are very small actually okay and every time it happened to be in the middle of the uh, boundary specifically for the alpha okay they also remember the bound values themselves are a function of mac number so they are not fixed numbers actually with respect to time the mac number is you know is, is velocity vehicle velocity by sound velocity is a dynamic variable so the bound itself bound values itself change uh, depending on the situation actually so that's why the you can see once of bounds values here actually okay. all right and ultimately you see this these points are meeting at the desired point this is altitude was desired to be something like 20 kilometers so, so it is all happening at the end and velocity also desired value is meeting you can see there's a flat line sort of thing so no matter what happens on the way the, the boundary conditions are enforced as as hard constraint that's the reason why it happens this way actually now what about uh, the, the next formulation which talks about uh, both pitch plane and yaw plane maneuvers actually that means uh, alpha ang angle of attack alpha as well as uh, bank angle both are control variables then what actually okay remember this part uh, this part of the problem formulation okay we didn't bother much for the for the position coordinates actually okay. whatever position coordinates happens happens ultimately is our path constraints and all has to be met and ulti ultimately i want some sort of a 
position coordinate in terms of height and I mean height only rather in a way. The latitude longitude was kind of uh, ignored basically there. But anyway, coming to this one, because we have bank angle maneuvers as well, so we can think about doing that as well. So, instead of E and gamma, which essentially talks about H as well, because entire formulation is based on E. So, instead of V gamma H uh, only, what you talk here is phi theta also basically. Okay. So, that is what we are interested in here, and then all of the things remain same actually. Okay. So, these are the terminal coordinates what I am talking about here. So, what you did here is if you get, there is an, some little bit interesting thing out here, what is uh, what you can see here is this uh, this uh, variables you want to control, but they they it is not a uh, direct function of sigma basically. So, if you if you consider sigma as a control variable, then you have a problem here of uh, problem of controllability starts coming and all that. So, what we thought is okay, we will consider psi as a as some sort of a artificial control variable here, and once we get a psi trajectory, then we can think about going to psi dot equation and compute sigma, because psi dot is a strong function of sigma here. You can compute, I mean once you have a psi trajectory, go to this equation and compute sigma based on dynamic inversion actually. So, that is what uh, we have done there and we can, oh, is happening here. Okay, so, that is that is what is done here and this is the intermediate control for bank angle profile sort of thing actually. Okay. Then also that it was done some normalization was done because you remember V happens to be very high uh, large quantity and the gamma uh, these are angles so in radians which has small quantities like that we introduced this uh, this normalization thing and then operated based on normalized dynamics actually. And as, as I told uh, J consists of three parts and then J1, J2, J3, J1 contains this normal load factor and remember it operates on some some factor here which is a, which is an exponential function of the previous normal load at that particular point actually grid point. That means, if there is the, the iteration sense if the previous value has taken it towards the boundary, then the the weighting function is increased. That means, uh, the update happens uh, should happen in the in the negative I mean in the other direction actually. Okay, so, that is the whole idea here. Okay, so, that is the how to address this normal load bound sort of thing. And then this J2 happens to have this uh, control deviation minimization actually. And remember, when you talk about deviation minimization, if you talk about the reference profile as something like 0, then you are talking about the control minimization directly actually. Okay. So, J1 is, is, is done to take care of the normal load constraint in a soft constraint way. And then J2 is done to take care of the, the alpha boundaries and sigma boundaries, things like that. And then, okay, these are all mentioned here. Okay, so essentially this this fellow is effective. Okay, um, only if the value is close to the bound. Otherwise, it's a very small value anyway, actually. Okay. But when it is close to the bound, the, the, it is increased exponentially. So suddenly, this source is source is power actually sort of thing. Okay, so this this is what you see here, J2. Okay. And this is what is done for smoothness actually. Smoothness means remember the derivative is small, that means the difference between these two should be small. But once you directly formulate that, the cost function becomes some, some, some sort of a complex function. I mean, the algebra becomes messy and things like that. So, what you thought is okay, instead of getting this deviation minimum, what about making this deviation minimum and that deviation minimum? What is this? This is actually the previous value of two, no, two neighboring node points, previous value of the control. This is what you want the correct value of the control k minus 1 and u k, u k minus 1 and u k, they happen to be the current values of control is is u k, this is what you want after update and the, this is what you want after the update at k minus 1. But these, these things are already available, these are numbers actually. Okay. But if you want to play around directly, then the cost function becomes uh, a kind of a involved, I mean, kind of an involved function. So the algebra is still messy. What you thought is okay, we can uh, we can get away from that uh, by just having this innovative formulation where you talk about okay, this this minimize the difference between u k and u k minus one whatever it is, it can be minimized by minimizing the difference between u k and u k p, so the previous value of the control at the same grid point as well as the difference between u k and u k minus 1 p. So, if I if I minimize this and minimize that and obviously, this has to be this will this will be minimized actually in a way. So, that is the philosophy we followed here okay, and telling that okay, uh, I mean this this is anyway taken care because we want devi deviation minimization here. Okay, When you do that, that is already taken care 
what you do is okay, we just need to do this minimization also actually, this is what is given here okay, for the smoothness part of it. All right, so these are all explained here, uh, what I have told already here and then essentially the cost function is ready, your algorithm is ready, these are some of the results actually. So, what you see is some 8 cases we have plotted, so you can see that for each of the cases all of the argument that I told you before remains valid and ultimately every all of the cases different different color coding and line coding you can see and remember if you are concentrating on that particular line here for the control segment control history then you should also concentrate on that particular line for the maximum bound and minimum bound okay, because everything happens to be time varying sort of thing actually. Okay. So, essentially if you concentrate this line then your I mean this is the upper bound and that is the lower bound the control history is like that way what the solution what you got actually like that. So, essentially you can observe that uh, all the alpha solutions angle of attack solutions happens to be smooth as well as they happens to be somewhat at the middle of the both the middle of both the bounds actually. Okay. Now, what happens in the sigma part of it uh, the bank angle it uh, we took some plus or minus 30 degree and it, in fact it can be taken much more than um, 30 degree because in case it is in a kind of an unmanned uh, mission basically. Okay, if you if you do not have uh, human sitting there probably the vehicle can uh, turn little more I mean can roll roll little more actually. So, anyway so coming back we put some 30 degree plus or minus 30 degree bounds for our uh, particular uh, experiment. So, we started with different different initial conditions and all ultimately you can see that uh, finally uh, the, I mean it is taking there but also remember the final bank angle what you are looking for is happening to be 0 actually which is also neat. Well, ultimately at the end of the re-entry you want to be a, some sort of a 0 sigma attitude sort of thing actually. Okay. So, these are some of the uh, some of the comments that I already told these are all smooth profiles and trim bounds are not violated here and, and you can also see that the final conditions here are met in a very tight condition sense you can see well, no matter whatever is the initial condition ultimately they end up at the same value that is why the, the final boundary condition is enforced as some sort of pay hard constraint actually. Okay. So, these are the powerful things that you talk about when you use uh, this optimal control based methods and approaches all that actually. And you can also plot these uh, these other th different things uh, this normal load and this uh, kind of dynamic pressure uh, values and all that actually. And you can see that uh, the all these I mean this is strictly below 3G and then this is uh, I mean this constraint is uh, is met okay and then you can see this this heat flux is also met actually okay, okay dynamic pressure this is the value for dynamic i mean this is the dynamic pressure okay it has to the bound is about 25 kilo pascal but uh, what you are getting here is 14 15 kilo pascal actually okay. heat flux is actually 60 watt per centimeter square but what you are getting is way below basically but that again depends on the mission and all that actually. So, if you go to higher and higher altitude and then try to come back your energy will be high and hence other things will come up actually. This particular experiment that you have done they it turns out that heat flux is not a major constraint actually. Okay. So, in conclusion for this lecture what it turns out that MPSV technique is, is a very promising technique for optimal missile guidance in, in particular but trajectory optimization for, uh, in general. So, what it does is uh, uh, Trajectory optimization philosophy is brought into the guidance design that is that is more important actually. Okay. So, it can be used in missile guidance, it can be used in any UAV guidance for example, it, any autonomous uh, guidance problem or autonomous vehicle guidance problem that you talk about uh, and you formulate it based on a, this particular formulation if it is amenable to okay, then you can think about using this and it will essentially lead to this uh, this optimal trajectories and optimal guidance all that. Various challenging, uh, I mean, we have solved various uh, st challenging strategic and tactical missile guidance problems. Uh, that I'll take it through, take you through in the next class, next lecture actually. Some of these problems, okay, and st are still being solved actually. Many things uh, you can think about uh, posing the problem in a in a good way, then try to extract the benefit of this this method actually. It has also been successfully demonstrated for entry guidance of a reusable launch vehicle that I've just taken you through, and then. There are some uh, some extensions like uh, like MPSC and all that with uh, with control parameterization. There is additional desirable characters characters like smoothness and things like complete faster computation and all that actually. 
So, it is now slowly getting a worldwide acceptance as well. I have seen many people kind of liking this, referring this, using in their problem and things like that. So, I encourage all of you to kind of put your hands on this and the algorithm is rather simple to code and, and, and experiment also basically. All right. So, with that probably I will list out some some references. Okay, these are the references that you can think about. Uh, this is the first one as I told, the last one is the very first one. But I have taken this RLB problem from these two references. One is already there, and the other one in the in the conference version is there. In the general version, we are, we are trying to submit as soon as possible, actually. So with that, I will I will stop this lecture. Thank you.